<clears throat> Okie dokie. Oh, hey, look, we're both on the fucking screen. That's important. You know, I'm bro. I call my face. Yeah, it's got you. Yeah, I'm <laughs> stealing your soul right now. What's going on, y'all? Paul the Barbarian here. Um, made a trip up to Philly. Gonna hang out a little bit. Decided to visit my buddy Sean here. Um, today we're going to talk about how to organize your practice and how to run one if you've never, if you haven't been in the sport a lot and you've got a group of guys that are really excited. We're going to try and give you a little bit more information. Sean's been writing up some serious stuff. How about you just inter introduce yourself? All right. Hey guys, I'm Sean Krakenslayer. Um, I've been fighting for five years now, I think. Um, I've gone from being just a fighter to captaining a team to regionally commanding uh, the Atlantic and the ACL back in those days and the ACS now. Chasing cats. Yeah. yeah. Um, mostly that's just an administrative thing, but uh, I try to keep in touch with everyone who's in the Atlantic. Um, I've fought in several national competitions, but I've never fought internationally myself. And that's not a big deal. There's the, like going going international is hell. There's a hell of a money sink. And doing stuff here in the states, I, we get more fighting here than we do overseas. Like if I fight maybe five times in a day at an international tournament, and if I go and I, I go to a practice here or do something like that, I get a lot more fighting in here for a lot less money. I was gonna say that's the, the money part is what I think about it. Like the price for me to go to an IMCF or a, a Botan would. Uh, Probably be what I would spend for the rest of the season for travel. Yeah, probably. And everything else would be local, which this actually follows really, really well into building a local scene because practice is actually where you get more guys to stick around than like big flashy events. Yeah. Uh, people like to see a consistent schedule uh, where they see some weird dudes at the park every weekend and eventually they start to ask questions. And with regularity, you have more people showing up regularly, so it looks like it's more of a thing. So you actually garner more interest and more eyeballs on you because there's a bigger group of dudes being dumb. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and swinging axes and swords and stuff and running around. Um, we've got a, we've got a whole little list in front of us because we, we decided to be smart and give ourselves bullet points. Uh, we ramble way too much. Hydrate. Yep. Hydrate. 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 Hail hydrate. Hail hydrate. Um, <laughs> very important thing, uh, as a coach, as a guy running a practice, make sure that you, the biggest thing that I feel is the preparatory part. Sometimes it gets in the, it, like it gets lost is stretching, hydrating, making sure that you're taking proper hydrating dra uh, breaks, like making sure that people are staying loose. If you take like a 20 minute break or something like that, make sure everybody like shakes themselves back out. Um, and that comes with like building your schedule. Like people start to understand like what how you want to run your practice. Um, and I think that that's where you're aiming at with schedules. Like being able to break down your practice and go, hey, we're doing like 20 minutes of our cardio. We're doing 20 minutes of striking, like stuff like that. Um, I'll shut the fuck up. <laughs> uh, no, that's uh, that's a lot of good stuff that we just went over there. I mean, stretching and warming up is something that we almost always neglect in this sport. To the point where, back when we were the Rhinos, we did warm-ups before a match once, and Ringo laughed at us. Yes, he did. Uh, so he yeah, then, I think he then pulled a groin in that same match. I think that might have been one of the times he got injured, and maybe he was coming off an injury. From might have been when he was coming off an injury anyway. No, I just, maybe, I, maybe he was injured from pulling a groin. Uh, yeah, he's always injured from pulling a groin. Yeah, Ringo. But anyway. Good times. <laughs> We're not here to talk about Ringo. No, do that was a different video. Yeah, it's completely different. Video. We got uh, lots of information. On that. Yeah. So what I've been doing uh, during this pandemic is writing up our practices and publishing them online at the South Jersey Pine Barrens WordPress. Uh, you can find that in the links below. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have scheduled. I have not scheduled. I've uh, written all of these programs so that someone who has a cursory understanding of steel fighting is able to run a practice in their location. Because we've got a couple of strongholds of steel fighting and lots of people who don't have leadership and direction around them. And, and that's and that's three quarters of the time is the lack of information where you start training guys wrong. Or you're just going, not wrong, but you're just going about it in an inefficient way. And all the information that we've put together over the last like five years for you, seven years, like nine years the sport's been around doing the thing. like. 
we've learned a lot. Why don't we have this information easily accessible? And I think that's really a good thing that you've been doing. Um, and that's why I've been trying to do this YouTube channel is put out more information for people to be, make it more easily accessible for people. Um, so what, what's the top of your list? You got end goal. So I, I have right now four um, bullet points for just what I think are the most important parts about making a practice for your own team. Uh, the first one is make sure you have a goal in mind for your practice. Um, if your goal for this practice is we are going to learn this strike, we are going to learn this throw, or we are going to spar this much so that we can incorporate everything in together. Going into a practice as a coach without having an end goal is just a plan for chaos. Uh, it's small, small goals. Aim small, miss small. Uh, the Patriot told me a lot of things. Told me a lot of things about organizing stuff and shooting things. But aim small, miss small. If you get like four different things that you want them to learn over a practice, like if it's a simple escape, a simple strike, maybe a combo, and like here's one play that will run, like we'll half speed it and not even be in armor. We'll just do it together and then we'll do it once and see what how everybody feels about it. Um, and a big thing about a big thing about that, I think every one thing everybody should have in their practice involved every time is communication. Mm -hmm. Being able to communicate to each other whilst in helmets. If you do the, if you everybody has a helmet or so, like everyone has some kind of helmet that they can put on that muffles their ear, making sure that you can communicate as a team efficiently with helmets on is insanely important. That'll it, give you the edge over a lot of teams. Yeah, a lot of teams are pretty willy-nilly. I mean, the first swords we called out to each other, but we all we were all fairly reasonably uh, experienced enough that we knew kind of what we needed to do, but I think a lot of our downfall was the fact that we didn't communicate. It. I would agree with that. Um, we just didn't call out things to people. I'd be screaming half the time and everybody would be like, what did you say? <laughs> well, that's just because you're screaming all the time. Ah, yeah, so it's, all, it's, it's white noise it's, to us. It's, 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, so like if you feel like the end goal is like hey we're gonna focus on striking today or we're gonna focus on team tech we're gonna focus on team movement today or like field manipulation or just rent escapes tackles grappling whatever yeah. you want. it doesn't need to be a simple a, a solid one oh we are going to learn this specific strike but you need to go into your practice with we are going to go over striking yeah uh, otherwise again you just kind of mill around and no one ends up learning that much yeah. Um, and really part of that organization brings me to my next point. Yeah. Um, have a schedule for your practices. All the ones that I post, I start off with this practice runs for X amount of minutes and then I break it down. It's always warm ups for 10 minutes, break to get water and you know, we're fighters, we mill about, we yeah. talk a lot. Yeah, we do. Uh, then go into night fit, small break to get water, catch your breath from that, and then we go into our skills work. Our skills work is usually broken down into 20 to 30 minute sections. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to make anything too long because people will get lost in it or become monotonous or something like that. And you don't want to burn them out with a super hard night fit to start out. Like give them hard, one or two hard workouts. Night fit, by the way, is the uh, program that's used by the Knights Hall. We've all kind of started like picking and pulling from it and using it. Because uh, it's a really great program. Uh, if you need to, if you want to find classes on it, check out thenightshall.com. Um, and on Facebook and everything else like that. Jay and, Jay and Kat and Marie and all those other mooks are up there doing good work, so I'm not going to argue with it. Um, but the, you don't want to blow out your fighters at the beginning of practice with heavy cardio or like a massive amount of like beating on each other or anything else like that. We do like to do a, a fairly intense night fit every practice uh, for two reasons. One, feedback from my fighters has shown that they like having that accountability there. That's agreeable. And two, we like to go off the fact of you learn to perform in a fight best when you are already exhausted. Agreeable. Um, At the same time, people don't people not don't exhausted. Like, they, but you are tired. You, they, they just don't. They just don't absorb nearly as much when you really don't try and teach them highbrow stuff when you blow them out on on. Yeah. Run. <laughs> like don't make them do wind sprints for half an hour and then try and teach them tier, top yeah. tier stuff. Um, and I think that moves into your next point very well is uh, knowing the levels of your fighters and the experience of people that you're working with. Like what people, what the ground level people that you have no, and then you can build off of that and point them in different directions. Yeah, I've definitely uh, run practices where I, you know, I was mistaken as to where my fighters were. Uh, I thought they were at this level, so I went on to the next one, and they they all individually came up to me and it said, hey, uh, I'm confused about this. Hey, I need help with this, something like that. Um, Don't and I went back when I was done and I said, okay, uh, we're going to revisit this in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, don't don't fear that 
feedback either. Like that feedback is very important. That allows you to grow and be better uh, as a teacher and somebody trying to run a practice. Even if you're learning this crap at the same time they are, yeah. it's okay. Um, if you're organized, you have a schedule, and you have like a general idea of a goal, you're ninety percent there. You're gonna run a better practice than ninety ninety percent of the other people out there running practices. Yeah. T- um, but that also does bring me to the last point. <laughs> um, it's gonna be less organized than you plan. Extremely. Um, I put five minute breaks into all of my uh, practices between. Uh, our exercises because I know that we're gonna have problems. Yeah. Definitely. So if you already build in that downtime, it's gonna be something that you can work with. Um, it's definitely it's definitely a thing about steel fighters that we all get hit in the head a lot, and we like to like ramble and go into different directions. Sometimes there has to be a guy with a clock on him somewhere. Don't use your cell phone because it gets broken during practice really easy. But uh, put like a watch around your neck or something like that. You can look down; it's right there. And he goes, "Oh, we've spent 20 minutes doing this. Everybody, shut up. Let's get to working out." I, um, I have my cell phone put off to the side with an alarm for, "Oh, this is a 20 minute exercise. In 20 minutes, it goes off." Yeah. Um, and that just comes down to like figuring out what you want to do. And this really doesn't take a whole hell of a lot of effort because he's already got it all written down. <laughs> like it makes it easy. Go check out his link. Yeah. I'll have it down in the description below. Um, and who? I don't have anywhere else to go with that one. I don't know. Um, a handsome if, Dan walked in and I, I got I got lost in this. Yeah, our our beautiful cat is here. <laughs> This is handsome Dan. He's the handsomest of the dudes. Uh, he loves everybody and is extremely handsome. Yes, he does the good work. Um, so one of the things that I want to say about my website before we go on further is that in the time that I've been running it, I have been reading more books about coaching and fighting and various other things. So the early ones are a little bit more of what we call black block practice, mm-hmm. where it is we do this one thing repeatedly, go on to the next thing repeatedly. Um, in this book that I've been reading, Fear is the Mind Killer. Uh huh. Who's that by? Uh, this is by, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong. Kaja Sadowski. Kaja Sadowski. Uh, this was actually uh, recommended me by Beth Hammer okay. to talk about coaching. Gotcha. Uh, it brought up that blocked practice looks really nice, but actually people learn a lot better with some chaos in there. So my practice has evolved over time, mm-hmm. as I hope everyone should. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm done talking about that, but um, <laughs> yeah, when, a little bit of chaos. When it comes to practices, how do you feel about the soft kit foam practices compared to full hard kit sparring? I think hard kit. I think hard kit sparring. Like we all need helm time. That's kind of a thing. But I like to incorporate lighter uses of helms and like gauntlets and having weapons in hand but not actually making contact with anybody other than a pedal. Mm-hmm. Like doing doing practices where you're screaming at each other inside your helmets and you've got like a clanking somewhere mm-hmm. else because it's loud as hell. So having that and being able to work on communication, that's also in a helmet. And if you're shifting around, running around a list, you're getting cardio, yeah. you're in a helmet, you're moving around with, you're building the neck muscles to hold your neck up because you don't have all that sh- extra shoulder padding there to hold the helmet up. You actually have to use your neck to keep your head up. And it also helps you teach, don't look at the ground. Yeah. No, don't look it down. Um, uh, I do love steel sparring for no, things. No, uh, I, that, was, that was the other part. The, the, I, I do a full steel kit practice once a month, once like once every other week kind of thing. Um, you guys can do like little scrimmages, you can square off against each other, you can have singles fights, whatever you want. I think that running foam fighting in a closed helmet, um, like the, the helmets that we have, I'd say wrap a piece of freaking cloth across the face of it just so it restricts you up a little bit. So it gives you more of that idea of claustrophobia so the helm horrors are actually knocked down. That's one thing we've noticed. Um, but I think you can do a lot more fighting in foam. You can do a lot more reps. You can have a lot more f- like goofy yes. fun. Steel f- steel armor takes a long time to put on. And it, it's, it's also it's costs cool. a lot more. You beat the ever living crap out of your armor. I mean, I don't know how many oh, guys no, have I don't to even mean that. I mean, you've got new fighters coming in all the time. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's a lot easier to get them to spend, let's say, three hundred dollars on an entire foam kit than yeah. twenty five hundred dollars on a steel kit. And I and I yeah, and I think that actually helps us build better field awareness as well because you can move faster in foam yeah you can run around a lot quicker that's the thing about battle days that they're finding is that their field awareness has gone up exponentially because they're able to they have to pay attention to a bunch of crap so I think really the idea with this is they are both extremely important for they different are. methods yes um, 
Ideally, you can do your practices and you can finish every practice with some foam fighting mm -hmm. just to get some sparring in. Yeah. Hey, you got that cool. Uh, and then you schedule your steel practices. Yeah, you make sure everybody knows so they show up and they do the steel fighting practice yeah. and you make sure and you have enough people in steel to maintain doing more rounds because when we go to a practice and we try to do steel fighting, like you put on the full steel kit and everything else like that, you maybe get six six rounds. Yeah. And people are dropping because of armor failures, there's not enough there's not as much um, Oh, enthusiasm to fix the armor repair real quick because we're not, yeah. it's not, we're not under pressure or anything else like that. You've also, you don't have the adrenaline, so you're more likely to... to feel injuries a lot quicker, well, or you feel pain You get punched in the face, you get some adrenaline, but it's still completely different from when you're competing. Yeah, it's, it's a completely different mindset kind of thing. And I think that's where, I think that's where foam outweighs, like, gives us a different angle to sharpen. Like, you sharpen, you sharpen every edge, and I think that sharpens a lot of edges that we have. Um, just by dint of being able to be faster and moving and, and doing more, uh, getting more reps in. Um, but that always comes, like, and then you can incorporate using steel weapons and steel helmets and everything else like that, and doing different drills and everything, so you still get more helm time in your actual steel stuff. Um, I like telling people, put on your gamisons and then go fight foam. Yeah. That's, that, that, I'd say the, the full foam kits are great and everything else like that, they're cool. If you use a nicer sword than just like pull noodle on a PVC pipe, I'm going to make a video about making swords so people actually know how to make swords and not kill each other. <laughs> if you wear gamisons and like one of the helmets you can buy for 80 bucks instead of spending $400, Get some cheap hockey gloves and you can beat the crap out of each other with gambesons on and then you're dealing with well, that heat exhaustion. What too. I like about having the uh, the foam as well is you can start working a little bit more grappling things, like yeah. kicking someone's shin. Mm -hmm. Honestly, if I'm just wearing my padded chalices, I don't want to kick your shin with my We're shin. Not kicking it's going to hurt a lot. It's going to be terrible. Yeah. So the, <laughs> I, I'm a big fan of the foam. Uh, we haven't had any speeded steel practices yeah. since COVID because... Mm -hmm. Because COVID's real, yeah. and you should be wearing masks, and you shouldn't be doing grappling practices at practice right now. And it sucks. Yeah, it does suck. It's horrific. <sighs> he had it. Yeah. Uh, he almost died. <laughs> um, so let's move on. Uh, like yeah. drills. When I come, when I think about drills, you just wrote it down there. Drills. I think about going to other sports that are akin to our sport and pulling their agility drills, their speed drills, their um, acuity drills, which is like sharp movement. I know it follows under agility, but it is more so about muscle training than anything else. Like getting the explosive action mm -hmm. that you get from a football from a football lineman or a um, or a linebacker or something like that. They have a lot of foot drills, like corner drills, are great for us because if you can kick a dude's feet out and you watch him fall over, you just kick his toe once. Yeah. You watch him fall over. It's it's the best thing in the world because you're like, I didn't have to touch him. I barely touched him. I love taking drills uh, that work on general skills like that directly yeah. from other sports, which have Proven that they work. <laughs> that's my that's my thing. They've already done all the research. But, They've already done all the R and D. But there's also obviously it's yeah. a different sport. We mm -hmm. need to do our own things as well. Very um, agreeable. I make up new drills for all of my practices. Yep. Um, one of my favorites. I was just calling a chaos ass to rail drill, mm -hmm. where I set up three out of four sides of our list and had a target on each of those sides, and we kind of ran around in a weird circle, figure eight thing. So there was some chaos, it taught everyone to get a couple strikes in, get their ass to the rail, and assess for what it was safe to find the next target. Those that's, are all extremely important things in our sport. <laughs> that's like, I think that actually makes uh, the fighter level go up like a couple notches when they have better field awareness. Like, because you can be a subpar fighter, if you know where you are on the field, you are exponentially more dangerous yeah. because you can position yourself to take out that guy real easy. I mean, 90% of the takedowns we have are blind sides. Yeah, just a so, cross check to someone from behind. Yeah, um, and you if you know where you are and you know where the other guy is, then that's not, you're one, gonna be more defending against it, number two, you're gonna be better to find that kind of thing. And the drill that I've been running lately, the past couple of weeks, uh, that I've been a big fan of, I, I'm calling line drills, where you have two partners, mm -hmm. and they're not close enough to be grappling. They yeah. are at like a B range, so they can strike at each other. Mm -hmm. uh, by having two people, instead of someone striking at a Pell, that target is constantly changing in height, in distance. It's forcing your attacking person to adjust every part of their strike, which is extremely important to learning. Yeah, uh, I mean that also. It also gives them a better analog. Like it's the analog that they need because another fighter is going to move side to side. He's going to move backwards and forwards. It, like you need to be able to build that range. You need to be able to build that uh, positioning situation. Like I like I completely follow that. Even just shadow boxing with each other, it's kind of what you're going at. 
Um, dancing around each other, like throwing foe strikes, making sure that it's blocked. You're not throwing real fast, you're like going like half speed, but you're still giving it some ass. Make them block and everything else like that, and make them try and position themselves to get a better shot on you kind of thing. Yeah. Um, we used to do a thing where you'd stand toe to toe and you'd just like strike, and then the other guy would immediately strike at you and you'd block. Mm. You'd have to immediately come with a with a with a parry or a block, um, mm. and we would just beat the crap out of each other with foam sticks. That actually um, sounds like a lot of fun, which is also very important to practice. If, if practice has to be fun, or they're not going to show up. Yeah, this it's isn't PE. This no. isn't a uh, boot camp. No one is forcing anyone to. They're be not here. beholden to you if, just because uh, just because you you're the leader. Yeah. If uh, people enjoy hanging out at your practices, they will keep coming. Definitely. If they don't. Some of them still might, but you're going to lose a significant After portion. After practice, beers help. After practice, beers helps a lot. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, per, no, I'm not pushing that. But hey, um, you got some other books over there. What else you got? Uh, so one of the other books that I've been reading lately is uh, "Becoming a Supple Leopard," which is, is about supple leopard, which is about body mechanics and uh, mobilization of all your different joints and how that works together. Mm -hmm. um, this I got actually because. Back when the Night Fight TV show was being filmed, mm -hmm. I was training to get into that, and I blew out my shoulder. Yes, you did. Uh, that was, at this point, I want to say two and a half, three years ago. Two and a half? Somewhere around there. Two Whatever. And two and I was still dealing with it up until about this past Christmas. Yeah. Um, after stretching. Reading, uh, stretching is a very static thing. Um, mobilizations, which is what this talks about, is more about getting deep into the muscle. It's closer to a massage thing uh, than it is to an actual stretch. Using a tennis ball or a lacrosse ball? Tennis ball? balls, lacrosse balls, yoga balls. I've got a bunch of different stuff in it. All the balls. Yeah. Uh, it's all about balls all over my body right yeah, now. Yeah, it's what it is. Uh, and after three weeks of uh, doing shoulder mo mobilizations, hmm. I have zero pain in my shoulder anymore. There you go. I blew my mind. I, just, I can't argue with results, really. Yeah. And my last book that I have over here is actually one that I have not yet started. But uh, I've been talking a lot on Facebook about how I want to become a better coach and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and Alex from Canada. Yeah, uh, Alex, uh, Bear Blackspear. Uh, he's got a YouTube channel that does all the breakdowns. We do uh, live streams every now and again. Um, he suggested The Book of Martial Power, The Universal Guide to the Combative Arts by Stephen J. Perlman. <laughs> Such a weak idea. <laughs> I haven't read this yet. He's such an analyst. But um, looking through it, it's got some diagrams. I love diagrams. You'll notice that when you go to my website. It's it's a good book. It's a, it's a very good book to read. It has a lot of very important things and shows you how to do specific things and to take control of a fight. It gives us better uh, a better way to engage. Uh, a lot of the martial arts actually deal with engagement from like non-striking range to striking range very well, um, and they translate like directly to what we're doing. So. So I'm very much looking forward to reading that. No, that's gonna be that, that's gonna be a sick time, and I'm gonna have to reread my copy. Um, the only other book that I can uh, recommend, otherwise, like as a leader, as somebody who's really trying to like get into this, you really need to understand where you want to come from. And I think one one book that helps that helped me do that uh, was The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Um, you take it, you read it, but you make notes in all the margins about what this passage, like how this passage correlates to what you're doing in steel fighting, or what you want to see in steel fighting, or what you want to be doing. I, I believe the way that Malcolm does that is he goes back and he reads rereads it every year or a couple of years and takes notes. That's what I Not mean. in the margins. Nah, uh, no. So that the second time he reads it, he yeah. can take notes and see what the differences in what he's picked up uh, is. Yeah, there's, there's a couple different ways. I wrote in the margins of my first copy and then I got a second copy and wrote it down in a notebook. Because I did that like five years later. Because mm. it's like from starting in rattan fighting to like a couple, like two years ago, I did that whole thing and I was like, oh, it, it, some of it matches up. Yeah. yeah. Some of, most of it doesn't. Yeah. Um, it makes. I think it, it lets you. F it lets you hit the core, because um, it's all really applicable. Mm. Um, it, between fighting life and everything else, it's why like businessmen read it and shit like that. Uh, it, it's just a thing that I suggest to everybody, and I usually hand a copy to all of my new guys that I try that I try to get in. Um, so. Thank you for sitting down and talking with me about all this junk. Um, and I think I think this is a really good way for us to bring more knowledge to people, uh, putting stuff out and. 
being able to let them teach others because that's the whole yeah. thing spread spreading yeah. the word and putting out more knowledge to people i really want uh the people who are new ish to this or who are forming a new team to have somewhere to start no, it's um i'm also hoping to sometime maybe in the next couple weeks or however schedules line up uh to do one of ringo's live streams with him about practices yeah uh, just because I think we can go into a lot of detail in an hour and a half, two hours. Yeah, doing, it, doing it a little bit more long form would probably be really good. Uh, and, you know, we can take community questions that way. Yeah, stuff. yeah. Uh, speaking of Ringo Trash Night, Ringo, check out his live stream. He was talking with, uh, he was talking to Sam. Uh, yeah, he evening. was talking to Samurai tonight. Um, hassling him. Last week, I think he talked to Jay. Yeah. Before that was Simon. Yep. He's been doing a series on the original Twenty Nine. Yeah, and he's, he's, he's been he's been pulling more stuff from the past and trying to uh, trying to get more of the stories out there because we don't know any of it. I mean, you have no idea how through who three quarters of those people are. Uh, at this point, I know who they are. But yeah, like through like through name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I, mean, I haven't seen some of those guys since I was in Illinois. Yeah, and I think I think they're saying that only three or four of them are still fighting, right? Yeah, really. Um, so check him out. Check out Alex uh, Bear Blackspear on YouTube. Uh, check out Sean's uh, link. Throw the link out. Throw yeah. the link out again. Uh, it's the South Jersey Pine Barrens WordPress. I'll have the link in the description yeah. below. Um, and check out my link tree. He's also going to be in the description below. I got T-shirts and everything else like that. You know all that kind of crap. Uh, hit that little bell icon. And if you're still around through this part of the video, you're a champion. You are really definitely helping my channel. I'll throw a like, throw some comments, whatever you guys want to know. If you've got questions for me and Sean, we're probably going to be doing another video at some point in time. I'll hassle him and we'll do something else. Yeah. It's either that or I'm going to come up and practice and punch on you guys. Yeah, do that too. That's a reasonable point. Yeah. Like they just need to be informed sometimes. Yeah. But <laughs> uh, I want you all to stay, uh, stay safe out there, uh, be chill, and uh, for one thing, get vicious or get the fuck out.